Netherlands to be a student missionary, which is a wonderful place to go to be a student missionary. <laughs> Discovered I don't do elementary school teaching well. Uh, came back, was his reader for a year, and the first class I took from him was freshman year, and it was a 350 level course, and people kept saying, you're a freshman, what are you doing in that class? And it was something about the different arguments of God. And, philosophy of religion? Yeah, probably. And so I was arguing <laughs> with him about... You don't remember? No, I don't. I'm old. I shouldn't say that. Um, and I was arguing with him about one of these, and he finally had had enough and just da 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 da, -da and I was done. You did it very kindly, but I was very kindly put in my place. I like that class better than SDA beliefs, where you had a quiz every week. That's just not my style. Um, but I absolutely you needed the discipline. Yes, there you go. I needed the discipline. That's probably true. Absolutely loved him as a teacher. Liked being his reader. One time, somebody um, let me know that I had not marked them off, and they were being honest. And I had a problem with that. And I said, "How can I now take a point from them for their honesty?" And he said, "Honesty must be its own reward." <laughs> <laughs> it's true. So I did take the point off and thank the person for a few slip for me. Come on up. He's um, doing out of this book, chapter one, with the title of God, which is a pretty broad topic. And um, I'm three pages from finishing the chapter. So that's all. Thank you, Laura. Nope. Yes, yeah. I remember Laura well. Um, and as. It seems that my students are now moving on into all sorts of positions, and I like to tell them it's, it's nice to see a former student doing something useful with their life. <laughs> well, I, it is true that this book uh, connects with or collects uh, papers that were presented something like 20 years ago. Now, if you've ever run across something you've written 20 years ago, it can always it can sort of leave you wondering what was I thinking or things like that. Um, Theology, however, uh, deals with eternal truths that are always timely, so we, we, we can go anywhere in history and find something of interest to talk about. Um, I thought what I would do today, though, is focus on an aspect of the doctrine of God that I touch on in this chapter that uh, has been, uh, I think, one of the most interesting features of Adventist thought because we have undergone over the years significant development and yet it has not, at least to date, created great controversy. Uh, if you think about some of the other issues that have come up, there's been um, you know, struggles over uh, how to interpret the sanctuary, uh, the nature of Ellen White's inspiration, uh, issues like that. There's been some fairly uh, um, clear uh, sides taken and discussions uh, undertaken. But when it comes to the, uh, the doctrine of God, particularly the doctrine of the Trinity, we've uh, made some rather dramatic moves, and yet uh, it hasn't, at least in this part of the world, I understand it's created some problems in other parts of the world, but uh, our, gra our changes have been rather gradual. So let me, uh, if I can stand behind the podium, will that work, Dave? I'll make, make an introduction of sorts, and then what I'd like to do is give you a handout and try to come to terms with what I take to be the very uh, essence of the doctrine of the Trinity, which I think is extremely significant uh, in understanding God and also in placing Adventism within the, the mainstream of Christian understanding. Now, what we've got here, how's the title of this book? Here? Let's see, it's something like Theology Society Experience. The connection between theology and experience is a very interesting one. Um, theology arises out of an experience and consists of reflection on experience, and it seeks to be faithful to the experience and yet give it a careful examination and the most uh, worthy expression that we can come up with. Um, I like the uh, the sort of the medieval expression of theology is faith seeking understanding. And in the introduction to his famous argument for the existence of God, Anselm says, help me to develop a concept of God that matches or measures up to the experience I have of God when I worship. See? And so here's a profound philosophical reflection that begins with prayer. 
And then there's an ancient formula that goes lex orandi, lex credendi, the law of prayer is the law of faith. So one of the tests of theological adequacy is whether or not it is faithful to Christian experience. Does it come out of experience? Does it faithfully reflect it? And does it have a positive influence on experience? So uh, I, I sort of think understanding is right at the middle there. Out of encounter, experience, comes confession, and then proclamation, and then reflection, and then ideally it goes back the other way. So we're seeking to give our understanding of God the clearest expression we possibly can, knowing that uh, part of the great command is to love God with all the mind. The heart, the soul, the mind. Uh, Jesus' version of the first great commandment as we find in Matthew. Well, let's take a look at where Adventists started when it came to the Trinity. Uh, what's interesting about early Adventists is that they uh, almost uniformly opposed the Trinity. Um, in fact, George Knight observed that most of the founders of the Adventist Church would not be able to join the church today if they had to subscribe to the uh, Statement of Fundamental Beliefs. Kind of an interesting thought, isn't it? Were they really Adventists? Or are we really Adventists, I guess the question. Now, when it comes to the doctrine of the Trinity, um, early Adventists straightforwardly opposed it. For Joseph Bates, it was unscriptural. James White described it as an absurdity. Emmy Cornell, it was the fruit of the great apostasy that also included Sunday keeping and the immortality of the soul. Not a happy uh, community for an Adventist doctrine. Mervyn Maxwell concludes that early Adventists were about as uniform in opposing Trinitarianism as they were in advocating the second coming of Christ. Now today, it's quite different. You'll find a rather clear affirmation of the Trinity and the Statement of Fundamental Beliefs. If you read uh, the essay on God in the Theological Handbook, uh, you'll find that there is a heading, The Mystery of God, uh, The Mystery of the Trinity, God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And more recently, Andrews University Scholars, a trio, coincidentally, put out a book <laughs> entitled uh, The Trinity, Understanding God's Love. And then there was another book put out by the Southern Pacific Division, if I got it right, uh, in response to some questions about the Trinity that were there. It's interesting to notice how the change in perspective is reflected in the hymns that you can find in the SDA hymnal. I think most of us here are familiar with the SDA hymnal. Um, I've asked young people about some of the hymns that I love to sing and they are totally unfamiliar with them. Oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast and Thank you very much. None of my students know the last line of that great hymn. Okay. Well, anyway, if you compare the 1949 version of the hymnal with the, uh, the one that came out in 1985, you'll find references to the Trinity that were omitted from some of the hymns in the 49 version are restored. And then there's some other hymns added. So in the 1949 hymnal, um, God over all who rules eternity becomes in the uh, line, last line of holy, holy, holy. God over all who rules eternity becomes God in three persons, blessed trinity. So there it is. The 1949 version of Come Thou Almighty King deletes a stanza that begins with the words, To thee, great one in three, eternal praises be. The 1985 puts them back in. And the 1985 publication has no fewer than 10 new hymns with straightforward Trinitarian language. So now we can sing the following lines. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. Holy Father, Holy Son, Holy Spirit, three we name you. And then hymn 148, the Trinity, whom we adore forever and forevermore. So we're actually using the Trinity as a as an out of address. So I think this indicates that there's been a, a significant development. I think we could say dramatic, but not necessarily uh, uh, rough along the way. Okay, it's just sort of emerged over time. And some would say that's the best kind of theological development there is. Okay, let's keep going. 
but it brought us into line with the earliest Christian thinkers. Now, what does the doctrine of the Trinity represent? I think uh, to understand it, it's helpful to go back in history. And to do that, to look at the development of the doctrine, there are a couple of things to keep in mind. One is um, that, as historians sometimes say, heresy is the mother of orthodoxy. Now what they mean by that is, the church doesn't necessarily sit down and say, okay, now let's define all of our beliefs. The church uh, is, is a movement of the spirit, and uh, people you know, are carried along by the fundamental claims of faith, and uh, they are, the church is stimulated, or let's say it's necessitated that the church respond to, to, formulation, or to formulations that would distort the understanding of the faith. And so orthodoxy comes out as a reaction to statements of faith or interpretations of Christianity, the important elements that would ultimately uh, violate it, dis disrupt it. The other is, and this is where things get sticky, I think, orthodoxy is typically more complicated than heresy. A couple of examples might work. Uh, are we saved by faith or by works? Which is it? Okay. If it's an either or, <laughs> thank you, that's the right answer. You get the point on the quiz. That <laughs> um, well, we might say, okay, uh, if it were one or the other, it would be simple. If it's works, well, just live the best life you can and you'll make it. If it's faith, just trust and forget about works and you'll make it too. It's just a gift. Well, we're not comfortable with that, okay, are we? It's, uh, we're saved by faith and how the reformers wrestled with this, yet not without works. So somehow you got to get both together there. When the early church faced challenges to their understanding of Jesus, uh, the question came up is, well, Jesus is, is, Jesus, is Jesus divine or is he human? Yes, you're right, okay. But it took a while to reach that, see? There were people who said, well, I think Jesus is just a very, very good man. Okay. And then at some point he was adopted as God's son, adoptionism. Uh, the others said, no, I think Jesus was a divine being and just came down and appeared to be human, see? And he never got thirsty, never got tired, but he ate and drank and lay down in the back of the boat just to sort of communicate with people who were hungry and thirsty and tired. Uh, well, the, the church came to the conclusion that, that, that neither of those will work because the only way we can do justice to the presence of Jesus and uh, the communication of God we find in Jesus is to describe Jesus as both human and divine and yet unified in one person. So whoever separates the natures or splits the person or denies one of the natures is not going to be faithful. You can see how that's much more complicated. How can you have two natures in one person without some sort of you know, schizophrenic operation where one personality or multiple personality where one takes over? Well, that's, that's how it goes. Well, if you come to the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, well, what is it? Are there three gods? So we got three of them. Hinduism has 330 million. Christianity has three, Father, Son, and Spirit. Now, nah, somehow that doesn't work. Well, um, tritheism, no, that's, that's never been what uh, Christianity's affirmed. What, uh, uh, what about one god uh, that plays three different roles? A little like uh, one one individual, one actor on a stage that, that play, you've probably seen these one actor performances that plays three different characters. You know, runs off and comes back with a, uh, an apron on or something or a hat or a tuxedo uh, to show that they're playing a different character. Does that work? Modalism, is God really just one and then behind uh, the, the Father, Son, and Spirit? Are those just sort of three, you know, three uh, masks that are worn? Well, the church wasn't happy with that either, so what? does the Trinity represent? How shall we understand it? Well, folks, it's complicated. 
Exactly. But to try to get a handle on it, we, we need to go back and take a look at what the uh, what those who formulated the Trinity were reacting to. And it, it, it developed in reaction to two um, elements in the ancient world. One was Gnosticism, and then the other was uh, Arianism. Arianism was one response to this. But, but the background here is Greek thought. So we're looking at a time in Christian history when Christianity made its way into the world where Greek thought was the prevailing intellectual climate. And you'll get two readings on what happened. Some see the Trinity as an example of a simple message of the gospel being co-opted by Greek ideas and corrupted, if you will, Com unnecessarily complicated. Others will say the Trinity is not a capitulation to Greek thought, it is a reaction against it. It's uh, safeguarding the faith from what would have happened had they just wholesale taken over Greek ideas. But here was one of the prevailing ideas. The big problem for Greek thought was time. The passage of time. Time eats up everything. And of course the Greeks had Two words for everything. <laughs> We've got Greek specialists here, so please uh, you know, indulge me. <laughs> Kairos, kind of time, chronos, passage of time. For the Greeks, time was a great enemy. Time consumes everything. Have you seen that picture of Goya, of, uh, of uh, Kronos devouring his children? It's, it's, a, it's a sort of a metaphor, an artistic metaphor for war. You know, war just Tear, you know, tears up everything. Um, and uh, that's how the Greeks viewed time. So Kronos is uh, sort of the father of the uh, Olympian gods and swallowed all of his children, uh, but that's a Greek myth we don't have to worry about. But the idea there is that time is our enemy. And so <coughs> to locate the ultimate, Plato and others placed it beyond time. So ultimate reality for Plato, for example, is a realm of ideas where nothing changes. And that, of course, made its way into the idea that God is completely timeless. We'll get to that in a minute. So time is the problem here. Well, some Christians want the idea that God must be way up here in a realm that's immune to time and immune from a material reality, and we, material beings, are way down here. Humans. Okay. So we're here, God's way up there, and uh, for some uh, mystery religions and so on, there are various levels of reality in between, sort of mediating levels of reality. Early Christians put Christ in the in-between area, okay? So Christ is way up here, about as, well, as high as you can get, but nevertheless <clears throat> between God and us. Because God is beyond the realm of time and matter. And so Christ who enters that comes from a position that's below ultimate reality and comes to be with us. That was basically Arian's or Arius' solution to how to identify the nature of Christ. God sends someone inferior to be with us. So it's, 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 it's as high as you can be and not be God, but you're still not there. Uh, and Arius was doing his best to work this out, but. Uh, uh, he accepted Origen's concept, God is unoriginated and devoid of differentiation. And Arius concluded that the Son is not unoriginated, nor is he any part of the unoriginated. And there once was a time when the Logos was not. It was not created, but he was begotten, and there was a time when he was begotten. So it's a time when God was all there was, and then the Son was begotten, and then eventually the Son entered into a human sphere. So the Logos may be God for us, but it cannot be God for itself. Now what did Trinitarian thought do? It elevated Christ 
to the very level we've gone. How significant was that? And the early Adventists who rejected the Trinity were, for the most part, Arians. At least I'm not a church historian, but that's what I'm led to understand. Okay. Uh, I think Christ and His Righteousness, is that Wagner's book? But he talks about Christ as, as beginning at some point in time, but so far back in the ages of eternity that it's you know not worth trying to worry about. But it is back there. So what's, uh, what were the early Adventists trying to do? Okay. Trinitarian thought rejects the ideas that God is timeless and that the Logos must be inferior to God. Instead, it affirmed that Christ is fully divine and therefore that God is intimately connected to temporal creaturely reality and God is inherently relational. Well, if that's what it's all about, why the confusion? that surrounds the doctrine. Well, what happened was, the theologians who are credited with doing this, the Cappadocian Fathers, wrote in Greek, when their concepts came to the West, they were misinterpreted, particularly by Augustine, who didn't read Greek very well, and uh, didn't make a transfer that was faithful to the originals. For the Cappadocian Fathers, Gregory of Nyssa, Gregory of Nazianzus, Basil the Great, um, God what? Time. God embraced time. For Augustine, God was immune to time, and so it goes down the road. Um, and here is where we run into, we run into some terminological challenges. Because how do you develop an understanding of something as marvelous and complex as the Trinity with language that's Greek in one sense you've got uh, hypostasis and usia and then you try to go to the West you've got substance and person and those words don't quite fit the same way and then it's easy to get involved because what happened was they, they tried to differentiate within the persons, well, within the Trinity itself among the persons, so how you want each one to have a distinctive role. So the Father is not generated, but generates the Son. Both the Father and the Son, the Spirit proceeds from both of them. And that led to a great controversy between the church in the East and the church in the West because the church in the West said it proceeds from the Son as well. And the East said, no, you're wrong. <laughs> and the Spirit proceeds just from the Father. And uh, that's a great controversy that helped to split the church in 1054, East and West. So you can see the complications have uh, significant, significant, or significant ramifications. Uh, I was struck... Um, by something attributed to the central character in uh, Far From the Matting Crowd by Thomas Hardy. I don't know if any of you have read that book or seen the movie, but the central figure, Bathsheba Everdeen, um, is beset with suitors. <laughs> Three men that are determined to make her their own, and they're doing their best to win her over. She wants to run a farm that she's inherited, I think. And they're doing their best to win her over by promising her their protection, which she doesn't need. <laughs> and uh, inducements of the age, you know, if you marry me, I'll buy you a piano, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. And there's a key statement in there where she, she says this. She says, it's hard for a woman to express her feelings in a language invented by men to express theirs. <laughs> well, I think in some ways that's the challenge with the Trinity because I've had people so, sort of criticize the Trinity and say you can take all those words that the Greeks used to try to define what was, you know, uh, what the Trinity represents and you can find other meanings for them back in the way they were used before. So I think what happened was the Christians were doing their best with the language available to um, to express something that involved a profoundly new insight, and that was that God, the ultimate reality, whose central character is love, actually comes into the material world, 
participates in it with us and expresses his love through that way. And the language that, that, that does that is always going, you're going to have to do some modification to express that. Now, I do have a handout, and we'll run through it quickly because I think it's possible to express the central idea of the Trinity without too much complication, okay? Oh, you're going to help me? That's great, okay. Um, I'll go to the back rows and you can take the front If you could share, I'm not sure I have enough for everyone here. You're going to help me with that? That'll be great. Okay. We have one for every one hand out for every two. I, I didn't know how many there would be here. We didn't advertise it as the Trinity, or maybe no one would have come. This is your favorite doctor or not. Um, when I went to graduate school, the Trinity was one of those things that was sort of noted on the way when I, I took several classes in the Doctrine of God. And uh, it was sort of, yes, the Trinity is there, and Christians have believed it, but... Uh, but it's not something that we're going to spend much time on. In the years since, and of course I realize there have been many of them, but in the years since, so much has been written about the Trinity that it, uh, it, it almost, uh, you can spend the rest of your life reading it. it, it can everybody see it somewhere, what I've got here? Yeah, well, let's be sure. Okay, we got some more coming. All right. Before your questions, let me try to get this out. I think... Another few minutes and then we'll open it up. I've come to the conclusion that you can express the insight. That we, need a, we need one right here. You don't have any there, do you? Okay. Uh, there's some folks over here that can't see it, okay? Clear on the other side? Okay. Right. I want you to be able to look at this because you have no idea how much time I put into this, okay? <laughs> do it for me, not for you. Okay? <laughs> I think that you can, I think that we can say, express the doctrine of the Trinity in two or perhaps even one sentence. All right. Ready? Everybody? Okay. There's my colleague Ron Grable. He has to have, is this my thought? Yes. yes. Do I need to get it higher? Is that yeah. better? Okay, are you ready for these sentences? Yes. Two sentences. Number one. Salvation is God's very own work. That's what the Trinity is expressed in. God did not send another to go about saving us. God himself, herself, came <coughs> into the world to save us. Well, who was Jesus? Jesus was God in human form. So that's one insight. God himself enters the world and uh, saves us from sin. So that's, that's the fundamental insight. I don't know what I did with my... Uh, oh, here we go. Okay. So God comes all the way down. God's not above, beyond, so remote that he's not interested in what's going on here. Salvation is God's very own work. Number one. Statement number two. What we see of God in the history of salvation is an expression of the inner reality of what God has always been. So what we see there is a, is a manifestation of God's true character, inner reality, as God has been all through God's existence. So the Trinity is a description of what God has always been. Have you ever known somebody or you met somebody and they made a very good impression and you thought this is going to be a wonderful friend and then you found out later that was just a kind of a facade? They really weren't that way. Well, have you ever had the opposite experience? You meet somebody, you think they're, they're friendly, they're going to be there for me if I need them, we can establish a relationship, and the more you get to know them, the more you realize that that first impression was exactly the way they are. Um, when our kids were in grade school, one of the teachers at the grade school there where they were going over in La Sierra had a reputation about really caring for her kids, just sort of 
unusually attentive to them. And I drove up one Friday to uh, pick my kids up, and I was a little early, so I just sat in the car. And then the doors opened, and the kids started coming out. And uh, I could see this teacher at the doorway of her classroom. She was down on her knees giving every kid in third grade a hug. <laughs> And to me, that confirmed, if you will, uh, sort of verified the reputation that she had. You know, she really is this way. It's not just something that, you know, people have said about her. She really is this way. Well, those are the two major insights. Now, the one statement that encapsulates both is attributed to the great transcendental Thomist, Jesuit thinker, Karl Rahner. He says, the economic trinity is the imminent trinity, and the imminent trinity is the economic trinity. Not exactly a bumper sticker, but here's what he's saying. Is, you know the word economy, which we apply to, I think, financial matters, generally speaking, or uh, you know, large-scale operations, goes back to the economy of salvation, really. It, it has a, a theological root. It refers to what God is doing through history to save us. Okay. Imminent. I-M-M-A-N-E-N-T would be something in, this, in itself. So basically it's saying, with, with, to put it really crudely, what you see is what you get. What you see of God in the history of salvation, love, self-sacrifice, compassion, concern, that's what God really is. It's not just a show. It's not just a temporary expediency or something. It's a revelation of God's inner reality. Now, this has got some of my favorite quotations. Let me take you through it quickly, and then we'll still have some time for questions. Um, how the Bible affirms God's threefold nature. You'll notice in these passages the sending of the Son and the sending of the Spirit. God sent His Son. We've got that. The Father sends the Spirit, the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. And when the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you. So the Father sends the Son, the Father and the Son send the Spirit. So you can see there's, a, there's an intimate relationship among Father, Son, and Spirit. What the Trinity tells us about salvation, that's the point I was making. It's God's very own work. It's something God himself gets involved in. God doesn't send a subordinate. Why is the Trinity is so important? Well, if you look at these statements, you can see that in the, in the judgment of those who have looked at the history of the Christian church, had this view of things won the day. The idea that Christ, though highly exalted, was really subordinate to God. Had that won, Christianity could very easily just have faded into another of these ancient Near Eastern mystery religions where you've got a cascade of intermediary beings and you're trying to sort of work your way up and eventually become one with God. It would have faded away. So that was absolutely crucial to the survival of Christianity. Emil Bruner, the, the statement right below that, that box, what was at stake was whether Christianity would become either paganism or Judaism or whether it should remain Christianity. We cannot be sufficiently grateful that the fathers of the church saw this danger, and they did all that lay in their power to avert it. And this statement, if you're going to underline one of them there, it would be, had Arius conquered, it would have been all over with the Christian church. Now, Bruner's a famous theologian, the Orthodox theologian, along with Barth, uh, go to the other extreme when it comes to belief. Bart Ehrman uh, is a uh, 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 biblical early Christian scholar uh, who's not a believer, and was at one time, not now, but this is what he says about it. The historical significance of the victory of proto-Orthodox Christianity can scarcely be overstated. If some other side had won, there would have been no doctrine of Christ as both fully human and or both fully divine and human. As a consequence, there would have been no doctrine of the Trinity. So he sees that too. And I've already said something about the Cappadocians to Augustine from clarity to confusion. So the second great truth, what the Trinity tells us about God, God's saving activity is a manifestation of God's inner reality. 
it's expressed in a variety of ways. I quoted Rahner there, economic trinity, eminent trinity, and so on. A couple from Karl Barth that I think express this so well. God is amongst us in humility. Our God, God for us, as that which he is in himself, in the most inward depth of his Godhead. In the condescension in which he gives us himself to us in Jesus Christ, he exists and speaks and acts as the one he was from all eternity and will be to all eternity. And then I think this is my favorite statement from Bart, not that I've read that much. But look, look at this one. I think it's a great Christmas statement. You can read it uh, for devotions at Christmas time. This is what Bart says. For God, it is just as natural to be lowly as it is to be high. To be near as it is to be far. To be little as it is to be great. To be abroad as to be at home. So he says, that's, that's what the Trinity tells us about God. God is just as much at home with us, facing the challenges we face on a day-to-day -day basis, struggling with the sufferings of this world. God is just as much God doing that as occupying the highest sphere in the universe with all the grandeur and the glory and adoration and so on. Just as much here. Others have taken the, the, the doctrine of the Incarnation and said that says something profound about humanity. David Bentley Hart says that, Jürgen Habermas. I thought Jürgen Habermas is interesting, a uh, critical theorist of the Frankfurt School. He points out, our idea of the intrinsic worth of all persons which underlies human rights stems directly from the Christian ideal of the equality of all men and women in the eyes of God. I've taught philosophy of religion for many, many years. We go through the various proofs for the existence of God. If somebody were to say, what is the most compelling argument for the existence of God, or why do you believe that God exists? Why do you believe in God? I think the simplest answer is, because I believe in humanity. I think I believe in what? Humanity. I think human beings have value, significance, worth. And if you trace where that comes from, and you want to give that a warrant, a basis, a justification. Ultimately, it comes from our confidence that we are creatures of God. It's our relation to God that gives us significance. Get that out of the picture. And what we do to each other doesn't matter very much. Well, anyway, uh, I could go on and talk about what the Trinity tells us about the church. But it's very interesting, particularly if you look at the, the farewell discourses. Jesus' last night with his disciples starts with John 13, uh, goes on to the next, uh, John 13 to 19, and Jesus talks to his disciples about his relation to them, his relation to the Father, and their relation to the Father and the Son by virtue of his ministry. And I think what you've got there is, in a nutshell, the idea that Christ's love for us brings us into the fellowship of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. So that's the really the understanding of the church, a community created by the love of God whose members participate in the love that characterizes the inner life of God. So it's the church through which the Trinity is most clearly expressed today. Okay, questions, comments, reactions. One here? In Christ was life original, unborrowed, and underlined. Who said that? Ellen, well, Ellen White, it's in Desire of Ages. In whom was life original, unborrowed, underrived? Um, is that the chapter? I think it's the chapter on Lazarus' resurrection, if I'm not mistaken. Could be there. But there you have a very strong affirmation of the, the full divinity of Jesus. <coughs> At least that's where I've read it. Neil? I'm, I'm curious, what is behind this uh, resurgence? of rejection of Trinity that, that rears its head from time to time? Well, that's a good question. What, you know, what lies behind the, uh, the rejection of the Trinity that comes along? Um, yes. You mean within the church? I have encountered numerous people. And they almost set up a network of their own. <laughs> oh, I, I don't know. Uh, you know. I think it's because, well, I can think of a couple of reasons. One is, uh, it's complicated. 
<laughs> How can there be three and one at the same time? And I haven't gone into the various attempts to sort of describe uh, the differences between the psychological and social trinity, <coughs> the various, uh, uh, the, the metaphors, the analogies somehow don't, you know, they always break down in one way or another. One of the favorite uh, sort of an analogies is the, you know, a lot of people will say, sort of Bible doctrines, academy, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> the Trinity is like a triangle. How many triangles? One. What makes a triangle? Three sides. So you have Father, Son, and Spirit. You've got three that make one God. Um, that may help at one time, but it doesn't really work. They're not like we've got three parts. So I, I'm not sure I got a clear... I've had some, some discussions with some people that, that almost bordered on surreal. Um, like, they would not disagree with the triangle, they, they would just put father on top. Well, above. Okay. Yes, the top point, you know. <laughs> you know, and I'm thinking, uh, and then they would come up with something like the Father is God, capital G. Yes, the Bible says that Christ is God too, but he's little G. And, and arguments, of the, and the whole argument ends up devolving on who's in charge. And I'm thinking, why is that an important issue? I don't know. Uh, this is why, I guess, I would go back to the same fundamental uh, elements that I've emphasized here. Because you're probably going to have a hard time sorting out all the intra-trinitarian relationships. You can do a lot of research in that area. I mean, a lot of very sophisticated uh, um, theorizing has gone along. Um, the idea is to sort of distinguish the three and yet at the same time have them within the one reality of God and all on the same level. It's almost um, as if we feel hell-bent to rank everything. That's a rhetorical question, isn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Please? Mark seems to imply that Jesus became divine at his baptism, when he came out of the water, the Holy Spirit descended on him. Right. Matthew and Luke seem to get around that problem by asserting that Mary was impregnated by the Holy Spirit, making Christ born divine. John doesn't seem to really address the issue. He seems to be saying that Christ is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, always divine. In Selected Messages, verse 1, Ellen White seems to be, or not verse 1, uh, chapter 1 somewhere. It's been a long time since I've read the statement, so I can't give you page and number. But she seems to be saying that Christ was elevated, and it was that elevation of Christ that made Satan jealous that resulted in the rebellion of Satan. Now my question is this, what does it mean when the Bible says that Jesus is the, be the begotten Son of God? What does that begotten mean? <laughs> According to uh, Rel Detteren, uh, a lecture that I got in Christology at the seminary, only begotten is not a good translation of that word, monogenes. It means, it's a better, a better translation would be only. Am I right? Yes. New Testament scholars, thank you. By the, by the testimony of two. He's not saying it was begotten, but it was the only son. It establishes the uniqueness. Son, son in human language implies begotten. It implies generation. Yeah, it implies priority. But I think there's, there are metaphors here to, uh, they're using language to describe the intimacy of relationship, not necessarily uh, uh, generation in any sort of, uh, uh, what would you say, beginning sense. There's no mother in, in the, the, opera, the scheme here. So uh, that's different. You raise an interesting question about how the various aspects of the New Testament assign divinity. I heard a great lecture 
uh, by a well-known New Testament scholar whose name escapes me years ago, he said you can sort of see from the earliest time the resurrection established the, the divinity of Jesus. And then gradually others recognized, well, even the cross in John, I, if I be lifted up, and then you can go back to the baptism, the, uh, the, uh, um, the virgin birth, and then on through eternity. So it was, you, you can see in some ways a, a graduated coming to the conclusion of how divinity applied to Jesus through various stages in the New Testament. Got to get a couple more hands. And Donna was next. Oh, you're gonna, oh, good. You're going to take care. I can't believe you're done. All right. You'll, uh, you'll feel, the, yeah. feel the hands for me. I, I was just wondering about uh, Arianism in Proverbs 8.22, which is the usual text that I've heard uh, is the most important. This is on the wisdom passage? Yeah, this is, you know, in the first of his acts of old, uh, I was created okay. first. And I, I understand, at least, and those of you who know the literature better, that uh, Ellen White suggested that referring to Christ. I am not, I am not as dismissive of our Aryan ancestors. Uh, I think they were actually had a lot of rationality on their side, uh, and I wonder now, despite the the brilliant language of the theologians, uh, when you do get down to saying one is three, and three is one. You just have a mathematical impossibility, and and I and I just I'm not sure that it matters as much about whether God is one or we have three manifestations. The way you describe it, Ricky, remember the beginning you used the illustration of somebody who keeps changing costumes, and then we have the God is just as comfortable being lowly as as high and so forth. This is kind of a change of costume. It, it seems to me, in, in a way, but I'm a very concrete thing. You got a lot of pro you got a lot of company in history. For it sounds like you're happy with modalism or Arianism. Yeah. You'll find plenty of precedents there. I, I mean, I just wouldn't dismiss all of our I'm not theological forebears as is theologically unsophisticated because they didn't understand the truth. I'm not saying they're unsophisticated. I don't mean that you. I'm just saying they're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. I mean, you can understand. You can understand the impulses to go that way because I think, I think each of those that you just so nicely summarized are simplifications, and to come up with, with anything that kind of makes sense out of three really being one is a challenge. You've got psychological uh, analogies. Augustine went with a psychological analogy. I think it didn't do justice to the Trinity, but it was a magnificent mistake because he went to the soul and generated the whole sort of history of autobiography, if you will. So it was, it was amazing, but... Uh, One more quick okay. thing. I come out of Catholicism before I come to Adventism, and it, it does seem to me as though Catholicism, which is the church historically, uh, is very influenced by not only the Greeks, but especially the Romans, the Roman uh, uh, intellectual climate in which Christianity came to maturity. Uh, and out of that religious background, a lot of things that we see in now incorporated in Christianity seem to me to be, in fact, uh, have and it's a pejorative word, but perhaps pagan roots, and that maybe one of these things is in fact the doctrine of the Trinity. And I say no more. Well, I think that's one of the reasons why, as I quoted an early Adventist said, we don't need the Trinity, because look at the company, as far as its historical origins, it has a lot of stuff we don't accept. Um, I happen to be one of those who thinks, okay, not everything was a gain. There were some losses, but I think the Trinity expresses an insight that was absolutely crucial to the survival of Christianity. But we'll continue to have this conversation. Brown Stainer, then Leo, then Peter. Okay. Thank you for your discussion, supposedly of the Trinity, but you've only discussed this morning two out of the three. Uh, my question is about the personhood of the Holy Spirit. Is there any recent 
consensus appearing within Adventist scholars about that question, which is pretty important. I don't know about Adventist scholars as a whole, uh, but you've touched on something very interesting. I, my, my hunch is, suspicion, that the spirit is some aspect that we are less uh, able to talk about because it is the aspect with which we are most familiar. We are most intimately connected. It's the spirit that enters within us. So if you've got God as the ground of all being, the creator, identified with God's fatherhood. You've got the Son as a historic presence. You've got the Spirit as the way in which Christ continued to be present among his people and in the world after he went. He sent the Spirit. So it's the Spirit that enables us to generate genuine community. And you can find uh, various things of Spirit. I mean, it's very strong. The various gifts in the church that enable us to uh, fulfill our mission, those are gifts of the Spirit. The Spirit speaks to us. How do we pray? We actually pray through the Spirit, or the Spirit speaks through us. So I think, I think we could go uh, and, and ex, you know, extend quite a discussion about the, per, the Spirit would be the primary manifestation of God in the world today. So you're describing the Spirit not so much in terms of personhood, but rather in terms of function. I think that I think person applies as well. Yeah. I don't think it's an it. I don't think it's impersonal. I think you could say he, she, and talk about the spirit. There are some who, in trying to describe intra-trinitarian relationships, would say you have father, son. The love between them is so vivid and palpable that it has a kind of identity of its own, and that we can call the spirit. But it's yeah. the spirit that uses. Uh, one of the challenges, of course, is spirit is. Uh, a much more fluid, almost amorphous word compared to father and son. We get fairly... There's no physical shape, there's no... Yeah, there, there's no counterpart there. But I think uh, that may be because the spirit uh, has an influence in the world that is, is perhaps more diffuse and more challenging to envision. But I, I, I would support the idea that it is personal. Thank you, Rick. This is great. Very helpful for me. When it comes to the doctrine of the Trinity, I've always been jealous of theologians. It just seems that you can better grasp of the issues of the Trinity than us exegetes. Because in the classroom, we'll have students say, well, show me in the text how the three are related to, to each other. And it's difficult to do, as you know, especially from the standpoint of ontology, the essence of how they're related. But I, I think that last comment is apropos. I, I can go to the text and show how the triune God is at work redeeming and rescuing humanity. But here's my question. What do you do when you wrestle with this issue and you come across the, the subordinationist texts? And I'm thinking of 1 Corinthians 15, when all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him that God may be all in all. How do you handle these subordinationist texts when you deal with that? Well, I don't know that we have to take them with a hard ontological sense, and that's because there's an inferiority here. And maybe this is the role that is played. Like some would say, uh, I mean, you, you hear this sometimes. People say God loves us, but if God loved us so much, why didn't God come instead of sending his son? Well, I think the response to that is that's how God came in the, in the form of the son. So the role that the son plays could be described as being sent. And that may have connotations of subordination or inferiority, but not at all necessarily necessarily the case. Um, now, there's some who say, well, I think they had a committee, has got a committee, and they sort of said, well, you know, uh, somebody's got to go down there and help those folks. Who will it be? You? And, and Jesus said, well, I'll do it. And God said, okay. And I remember my grandfather saying, could just as well have been one or the other. I don't think so. I think the, the uh, as those who describe the inner life of God, the, the, the Son is the one through whom God manifests divinity within the creaturely world. Okay, the agent of creation then, the one who speaks the words that bring the world into existence is ultimately the Son. At least according to the opening verses of John, you know, by whom the world was made and so on. So it's the, what would you say, the, the outward expression of God that uh, generates relationships with the world. Is that subordination? Uh, maybe in a way, 
But I think the willingness of the Son to come and the willingness of the Father to send the Son uh, could be interpreted as, as co-equal manifestations of love. That's Ron had a hand up. Uh, and Peter as well. So. Ron Greville, um, I'm, college and seminary classmate of mine. <laughs> I'm puzzled by uh, James White in um, January of 1846, the same Daystar article that a Daystar issue that had Ellen White's first vision. He says, um, this class can be no other than those who spiritualize away the existence of the Father and Son as two distinct, literal, tangible persons, also the literal holy city and the throne of David. And he goes on later in his article to say, God is a literal person. He has hair. His hair is white. Why is he so... Why is, Wasn't he sort of anti-Trinitarian? Why is he so insistent on this literal, tangible person? Well, he, he, I know you have an answer to that. So. <laughs> Let me see if I've well, you know, I'm not sure I do. I've been away right. from this for 30 years, and I'm, I'm just struggling to... Get my well, feet on my ground again. I noticed that in the chapter, if you read it, you may have noticed, Ellen White addresses the question of God's personness directly in at least two, two places in her ministry. One is the time uh, uh, of the article you're referring to. I don't know exactly what the spiritualizers were doing, but evidently they were minimizing or detracting from the idea that God is a real personal being and not just a kind of an impersonal force. Okay. And at that point in her ministry, Ellen White reports a vision that she had where she sees the sun, and then there's the father shrouded in impenetrable light. She asks the son, does your father have a form like yours? And the son says, I'm the express image of my father's person. And so she sees the light moving around and figures, okay, a la James White, there are two physical identities. Now that would have been her way of expressing uh, against the spiritualizing tendency in the church, uh, the, the, the true personal reality of, of God. Later on, the pantheism crisis, you read, I think it's eight, volume 8 or 9 of the testimonies, um, Ellen White is arguing against the idea that God is a, a sort of an impersonal force within the world and so on. She never refers to God having some sort of defined physical shape, but instead she says we see God's personness in creation, and she says something like he is not merely a force in nature. So it's like saying, yeah, okay, the pantheists are right but incomplete. God is a force that extends through all reality, but not just an impersonal force. We see that God is a person in the nature of the reality that God's created. So I would see quite a difference in her perspective from the 40s to the, the 90s or so when she's addressing that other. So she, she seems not to rely on God as having a specific defined visible form, uh, certainly not talking about hair and that other stuff. Well, at this point, James White is arguing against the spiritualizers whose chief teaching was it yeah, Jesus did come on October 22, 1944, and he now is here. Where is he? James says, no, look, I don't see any white hair here. I just see you guys <laughs> making a mess of things. So he wants to insist on the literalness of God as opposed to these people who are saying, he just came spiritually. He's now in the perfect person of his saints. And so we can marry each other as many as we want because we're perfect now. <laughs> well, that's a springboard for all kinds of comments. <laughs> uh, thank you for that. But I, I think the problem was is 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 God a, a genuine person with whom you can interact? Yeah, yeah. And that later on, she uses force. she uses different language to against a different sort of interpretation to emphasize God's personness. God is distinct from the world, not just a force within the world. There you go. How are we doing time ways? Uh, last question? Much, yeah, last one. one. Thank you very much, Dr. Rice, for examining uh, this very complex topic. Uh, two, two quick things. 
First, in your view, how the, the Nicene Creed saw this defining God, the definition of God? And uh, the second, in the chapter, I found a statement that it's kind of a, raising some, some question for me. When you talk about the knowledge and foreknowledge of God, you say that it's temporal. And uh, if you can elaborate a little bit, because in, if we put it in relation with the prophecy, how, how we will fit together? Well, that's a good question. I think, let me, let me try to answer very briefly within the framework of earlier, some earlier comments. The Greeks removed God from time. The passage of time in the material world where things happen in sequence, God's not susceptible to that. God exists independently of that. The Bible affirms not that God is atemporal, but that God is involved in history. God experiences this world. And I think the best way to account for that is God experiences things as they happen. For the Greeks, Greeks versus Hebrew prophecy. The Greeks believed in prophecy. They thought what you needed, that the future was determined, but how to get access to it, you needed to go to a place like the Oracle of Delphi, where the Sibyl would sit over the, you know, the fumes that came out of the earth. And uh, then you, if you were lucky, uh, you know, some advanced information about what was going to come would be available to you. Prophecy in the Bible, as I understand it, involved the notion that the future is not predictable. But to know what's going to happen, the principal actor on the stage of history can tell you what he intends to do, and that's what God is. God's the one who expresses what God intends to do. So it's not the case that you've got all of history laid out there, already decided, and God just looks into the future, like you or I might flip forward in a book we're reading to see what ultimately happens to the character before we work through it. No, I think the future is open. But to get into that would take a long time. More time than anyway, good question. Thank so, you very much. Um, benediction. <laughs> The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. See you next time.